Hello and welcome to the Grandfather's Cave. In this video I want to talk to you about magic, or rather the magic system that I introduced for my Advent Fantasy RPG. It is a system that resembles a lot Pathfinder and Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 and you would be able to convert it very easily to those systems. I also think you would be able to use it in other versions of Dungeons & Dragons, but I have not tried that. The magic system that I advocate for is not a role to cast system, but it is rather a role to retain system. Thus, it introduces some mechanics that resemble those of Dungeon Crawl classics. But a spellcaster will generally be able to cast their spell regardless of what they roll on their check. But before we dive further into this subject, I suggest that you subscribe to this channel and ring the notification bell if you have not done so already, so that you don't miss any future videos. Now let's roll initiative and let's get started. As I mentioned, the system I use for Advent Fantasy is a role to retain system. That is, unlike the Dungeon Crawl Classic system, in which you fail your spell if you fail your role, in this system, you still cast a spell normally, but you will lose it from memory. That way, I retain a lot of the aspects of the slot-based system of Vantian magic, but I give the wizards and the clerics some more mileage for their spells. In general, half of the time, they will be able to retain the spell. When making a caster level check, you will have to roll a d20 and you will be adding half your caster level rounded up and will be adding either your intelligence or your wisdom modifier, depending on whether you're a cleric or a wizard. And if that result matches the spell's difficulty, then you have successfully retained that spell in memory and cast a spell normally. The spell difficulty of a spell is 10 plus two times the spell rank. Thus, a rank 0 spell will have a spell difficulty of 10, a rank 1 spell of 12, a rank 3 spell of 16, and so forth. If a spellcaster rolls a natural 20 on a spell power check, that spell is retained in memory and is cast successfully. And in addition, if the spell allows a saving throw, it is treated as if that saving throw was automatically failed by the targets. This is the equivalent of a critical hit. However, if the spellcaster rolls a natural 1 on the spell power check, the spell fizzles. This is the equivalent of a fumble. And the spellcaster will have to roll at 6 plus their luck die in order to determine the effect of that failure. Just as with critical hits, when making these fizzle or fumble checks, a low roll is bad and a high roll is good. If the spellcaster rolls sufficiently high on this check, then they might actually be able to complete their spell with some modifications. And on the other hand, if they roll very low, that might be bad for them. Not only will they forget the spell, they might actually fail to cast it entirely, and if they are really unlucky, they might actually sustain Eldritch Taint. I will get into Eldritch Taint a bit later. While spellcasters might seem more powerful with this magic system because they might be able to reuse some of their spells, it is also more challenging to cast spells because the casting time of spells is a double action. For those of you playing Pathfinder or Dungeon Dragons 3.5, that would be the equivalent of a full round action. The exception to this rule are rank zero spells, which have a casting time of a single action, and rituals, which were originally introduced in Dungeons & Dragons 4th edition, which require one hour or more to cast. Thus, in general, spell casters are vulnerable when they cast spells. They cannot move around to position themselves better or to protect themselves. They have to stand still and are thus more susceptible to enemy counterattacks. Just like most spells require a single action to cast, most spells also require a somatic and a verbal component. However, no spell requires a material component. Material components are entirely optional in the system. That is, some spells will have a listed material component, such as fireball requiring sulfur or bad guano, but these components are optional. When a spell lists a material component, a wizard has the option of using that component to enhance their spell. When they do that, they gain a plus one bonus to their spell power check. But if they are not able to provide this material component, it has no adverse effect. Thus, material components does not become a boring bookkeeping process for players, and on the other hand, it is not something that is totally disregarded either. In general, spellcasters will like to have this option and will be interested in acquiring these material components. Thus, this becomes a new currency, and wizards will generally be interested in exploring a bad cave for bad guano. They will be interested in going into a magical emporium to find new rare components, and when walking around the forest in the night, they might be looking for glow worms or fluorescent moss or something like that. The idea here is that magical components should not be a burden on the players, 
but should be something that they find interesting anyway. Some spells do require a magical focus. However, these are not expended, and once acquired, the spellcaster will be able to reuse them at will. However, some spells have a cost list. These are spells such as Restoration, which requires the expenditure of a certain amount of diamond dust in order to cast a spell. Therefore, there is a difference in the system between material component and costs and magical fossi. Now let's try to take a look at a couple of spells. This here is the Disrupt Undead spell. As you can see, it belongs to the School of Necromancy. It has a casting time of a single action, because it is a rank 0 spell, and it has a range of close, which is always 50 feet. It creates a ray of positive energy, and since it requires an attack roll to complete, it does not allow a saving throw. Another example of a spell is Restoration. This is a rank 3 spell. It belongs to the School of Conjuration, and unlike most other spells higher than rank 0, this has a casting time of 3 rounds, instead of just a single action. As you can see, it has a listed cost of diamond dust worth 100 gold pieces. It has a range of touch, and affects a creature touched. And one last spell we could take a look at is Invisibility. This is a rank 2 spell from the School of Illusion. It has a listed material component, an eyelash encased in gum arabic. This is not a requirement, but if the caster has access to this material component and expends it during the casting, they gain a plus 1 bonus. On the spell power check. It has a range of touch, targets a single creature or object, and has a duration of one minute per level. One aspect of spells in the Avern system is that many of them are reversible. That means that the same spell can have two different and opposed effects. For instance, a haste spell can be used to haste your allies, but it could also be used to slow your opponents. Reversible spells can be used to counter themselves. If someone has cast slow on your friends, if you cast haste on them, then it will automatically nullify that effect. When preparing a reversible spell, the spellcaster should choose which effect they want to prepare. When they have done this, they can use that version of the spell as normal. They are also able to access the reverse version. However, this spontaneous reversal of the spell increases the spell difficulty by plus 5. And thus, while it is always an option to cast a reversed spell spontaneously, it is something that should be undertaken with care. In order to customize their spells, spellcasters have the option of learning Eldritch Feats. Eldritch Feats resemble the old metamagic feats. However, they carry with them an added risk. Whenever a spellcaster fails a power check for a spell modified by an Eldritch Feat, the risk Eldritch Taint. As mentioned earlier, Eldritch Taint can also be sustained when you roll a natural 1 on your power level check. The severity of the Eldritch Taint sustained is dependent on the rank of the spell you are casting. Thus, a rank 1 to 3 spell will cause lesser taint, a rank 4 to rank 6 spell will cause intermediate Eldritch Taint, and a rank 7 spell or higher will cause greater Eldritch Taint. When the presence of Eldritch Taint has been confirmed, the caster should roll at 10 plus their lock die and subtract the spell rank. Just as with fumble checks and fizzle checks, rolling low is bad and rolling high is less bad. If, for instance, we look at the lesser Eldritch Taint table, you can see that if you roll 10 or more, you simply fall unconscious for 1-4 to four hours. That can be pretty bad in a combat situation, but does not carry with it any long-term penalties. That is the best possible result that a spellcaster could hope for when rolling on the lesser Eldritch Taint. A more average roll would be a 5. You develop painful stigmata and you develop painful stigmata on your hands and feet that never heal, suffer 4 health points of damage. This result only has short term game effect as the health points can be healed quite fast. However, the stigmata remains and that adds an interesting element to the character which might create interesting role playing opportunities. However, if you roll really bad like a 1, you develop horrid pustules across your face. The pustules never heal and you therefore permanently lose 1 point of presence. This is bad and this is permanent. So in general, while taint should be avoided in most situations, the effect of the taint can vary a lot from negligible to, to permanently debilitating. Intermediate and greater Eldritch taint have separate tables, of course, with even more dramatic effects. The effects are to some degree inspired by Dungeon Crawl classics, but I have made extensive changes in order to make them suit the Aberrant Fantasy RPG. This was a quick dive into the magic system of the Aberrant Fantasy RPG. As stated earlier, it is quite easy to implement in either Pathfinder or in Dungeons & Dragons 3.5, and I suspect that you'll be able to introduce it into other Dungeons & Dragons versions with a lot of ease. If you enjoyed the contents of this video, please press the like button, 
and leave a comment. Is there something in the system that you think you would like to implement in your own game? Or do you run magic in an entirely different way? In the description of this video, I will leave a link to the magic system that I've shown in this video. If you would like to show your support for this channel, subscribe and press the notification bell. And you can also buy me a coffee. Until next time, keep slaying.